Yeah, I think it's time to, to get going. And I really want to introduce our speaker, our member, and uh, president of the Pennsylvania Postal History Society. You know, this is, you know, Steve and uh, his second presentation this year. He's been involved in stamp collecting postal history for almost 40 years. His main interest is Philadelphia postal history with a focus on transatlantic mail. Steve also has a large collection of letters addressed to Eli Beatty, the cashier of the Hagerstown Bank in Maryland and the Hal Cobb of Georgia. And he's won literature award for writing philatelic articles and for website design. In addition to that, he also edits our uh, YouTube videos that uh, Charlie posts on the the new on the, the website. So Steve is, is an all around man. And he, like, unlike many of us, he's working more than full time. Probably get paid for full time, but a lot more hours than that. So, Steve, we are really grateful to have you come back again. Uh, time is, is is whatever you need. If you want to do this stampless tonight, that that's up to you. Do you want questions to, at the end, or do you want them during? Yeah, I think if if we could mute and then maybe do questions at the end. Um, the problem at the end. with this is there's a lot of slides here. And okay. I've, I've really worked hard to cut it all back, so I'm not going to have probably a lot of time to talk about each one, but uh, we can talk at the end. And then, uh, as Paul was saying, maybe we can have another session um, with additional mm -hmm. covers, and I'll make this all available to everybody. I I, I, yeah. I want to share everything, so everybody will have an opportunity. I mean, this, sound, this sounds like, you know, the gold at the end of the rainbow. I mean, it, it sounds fascinating. Okay. So Well... The, anyway, so let me share my screen and mm -hmm. see if I can get that going. Um, hit, hit share here and um, see if that'll work. And I'll go into the presentation mode. Can you see my screen there like in full screen? Okay. All right, good. So um, thanks for the great induction, Paul. I really appreciate that. And the funny part of this is, uh, like Paul was saying, I have a lot of letters to Eli Beatty. Well, I'm here to tell you, I, I, I thought I had a lot when I started out and I had probably 40 or so. And I thought, oh, geez, I, I must be one of the people that had, you know, the most of these things. Well, then uh, I met some other people that have a much bigger uh, collection than I did on this. Dr. Brian Claggu is on here tonight. Um, he is this this presentation definitely would, wouldn't be possible without him. Um, most of this, uh, a, a good portion of this material is his, and he did do an award-winning presentation um, probably about 10 years ago, and I look forward to continuing to collaborate with him. He's been very gracious in sharing his materials, and he's he's got some really cool stuff, and I found some other people, too. It's kind of neat when you start on something, and you think you're the only one out there, and it turns out, wait, there's another guy, and another guy, and another guy. And everybody has a fair amount of these and it all starts to add up. And I said, well, I'm gonna start compiling them, right? Um, as Paul mentioned, um, at some point, maybe we can get to a census. I, I would love to do that. I think it'd be kind of neat. If it's if it's useful for people, I, I think it'd be kind of cool because there really is um, much more to learn about this. And that's what uh, Dr. Clagg, you, you know, had done is he tied in a lot of things that I can't tie in just in a one hour, one and a half hour presentation. But his exhibit uh, talked about how the mail got from where it did, where all the banks, where it came from, the banking industry at the time compared to what we have now. There's there's just so much material that can be done on this, and it's very interesting. So um, I this is probably going to be a lifelong pursuit for me. And one of the really cool things about this, the way I started this, most of these are really inexpensive. Um, you can look on eBay at any given time and find Eli Beatty covers or Hagestown. I, I shouldn't say that because then I'll get beaten to, to get stuff with people. But, you know, you can find some out there for 10 bucks on, on eBay. So they're, they're not, most of them are not very expensive. Um, I will show you some that actually are very expensive. Um, and there's a, a reason for that. But the good majority of them aren't really that expensive. And uh, I went to some shows and I saw some things like I, I know some people. I'm very lucky. Um, the people have amazing exhibits. And I knew that I could never do an exhibit with some of that. I mean, some of these guys spend hundreds of thousands or more dollars on their exhibits. I knew I would never get to be able to do something like that. So I said, well, what's something the average guy can do? Right. So uh, Eli Beatty kind of fell in place, you know, the very inexpensive. I don't do an exhibit on it. I'm not an exhibit guy, um, although I do like that whole thing and I support it and I think it's great. I'm more of a presenter. Right. I like to share information with people and I want everybody to see what's out there. 
So um, just to start out with on our first slide here, Eli Beatty um, was the from the Hagerstown Bank. And the funny part of this, everybody knows me as a Pennsylvania guy, a Philly guy, and I like that material. But I did live in Maryland. I lived in the Frederick, Maryland area for about 25 years. And I collected stamps and, and, and just started on postal history during that time. And believe it or not, I never heard of Eli Beatty, um, even while I lived there. It wasn't until I moved to Florida that I really uh, heard about Eli Beatty and got into uh, the details and found out how many of them there were. Um, there's several dealers, especially Labron. Uh, Harris there is in, um, uh, in Maryland and several other people have, you know, conjecture of over 10,000 covers. So we're only going to scratch the surface here. But um, Eli Beatty was the uh, cashier, um, which we now call the manager of the bank of the Hagerstown Bank from 1807 to 1859. So it's a 52 year span. And uh, these covers were all found there at the bank um, when um, uh, it, the building was sold. Uh, Montgomery Ward actually started a store. You can see these here. There's um, there's one actually bank. The original one started in Colonel. Rochester, we'll get into who he was there, just like Rochester, New York guy, but 1814. But prior to that, I was in Colonel Rochester's house. Then they had a building built. And then after that, the other building on the right hand side, you know, less until 1936, and Montgomery Ward took over the building there. So I'm going to go on a little bit. Just a little bit of background about uh, Hagerstown. This is another fun fact. I, I didn't know it. I literally lived 20, 25 minutes away from there. Um, it was not originally named Hagerstown. Of course, I thought that was always the thing, but Jonathan Hager was a German immigrant that moved there. And um, the town was originally named Elizabethtown after his wife, right? So it wasn't until later that um, they actually changed the name over to Hagerstown. And uh, it became now there, uh, everybody has these little uh, nickname types things. It's the hub city because it's kind of in the middle of uh, Maryland, a lot of things going on around it there. So um, that was another fun fact I did in the research there I found out about. And uh, I'm a spreadsheet kind of guy. So I wanted to show here just to illustrate um, when um, Eli Beatty was the, um, you can see the long green line on the bottom when he was uh, actually the um, cashier of the bank. There were two years where he was the acting president of the bank. And there was another guy that came in there. Um, to be the cashier at that time, his name was Daniel Sprague. That'll come up here shortly. You'll, you'll hear about him too. But without going into too much detail, I just tried to show who the presidents were of the bank. And one of the interesting parts is Nathaniel Rochester. He was a colonel. Um, he, um, he was the postmaster of Hagerstown and Eli Beatty was actually his brother-in-law and the previous assistant postmaster along with Colonel Beatty. So there are some ties there too. To, to those guys. Um, it is very difficult to find things from, from uh, Nathaniel Rochester. And I, I, I can't thank Dr. Claggett enough, enough for this because I personally have never found any personal correspondence either to or from Eli Beatty or to or from Colonel Rochester. So this is, uh, to me, this is one of the prizes of the collection. Um, and he has graciously let me use this. And to me, it was really, really exciting because it's a personal letter between those two guys. And I couldn't, I, I mean, I've been looking for years and I haven't been able to find any personal correspondence from either one of them to or from. So this is from 1800. You know, this is before the bank even, you know, came around. So that was uh, much later. But I still wanted to put this to me. I think this is a, an amazing uh, part of history right here. Colonel Rochester, long story short, he was there in Hagerstown. He went other places, ended up in Rochester. You know, they named it after him, Rochester, New York. And he had a lot of fame and fortune there. One other thing I'd like to point out underneath of the cover that's here is I made a little, um, uh, uh, took this from a spreadsheet. And there are two guys that wrote about the, um, the markings in Maryland, and that's Kendall and Powers. And I, so I did put it there to, re, if you have those books, you can refer to them. If not, I'd be happy to look stuff up for you. Similar to the American Samples cover catalog, how they had all the different uh, cancellations. Well, these guys numbered them, showed the earliest and latest known usages, the sizes, colors, pricing and scarcity. So um, when I when I could, I, I put that underneath of there. So this is one of the first cancellations from Hagerstown um, from 1800. So very interesting to me. I. I You'll see once you once you do these, it's kind of like I used to be a barbecue judge for a while, you know, and you start to think, how can I tell these things apart? 
Well, after a while, some things seem very common to you. It's like, oh, I've seen a hundred of those. I've seen a lot of these. I've never seen one like this, right? So this really stands out to me. So it's important. So I'm just going to touch on this. I'm not going to go into detail on these. You guys probably know these rates better than I do, but at the beginning of each of the rate changes, I just put a slide in here to show what the rates were for the different mileages, whether it was per sheet or per ounce. Those are just for reference only. Just going to go over them really quickly because um, we're, you know, just to make sure we have the right rates. So one of the very first covers, uh, of course, this is Dr. Clagg used to, you'll see the courtesy of on these slides. And uh, although it's predominantly his material and uh, mine, there are some other people that have contributed to this. So please look out for that. Um, I'm not gonna read them all off. Um, on some of these, you'll see just the cover, the, uh, the, the uh, back of it here. Um, on the ones that I have on mine, I actually scan the inside too. So you'll get a little bit extra out of that. So this is kind of interesting and different. It's the earliest one we have um, in 1810. So it doesn't look very uh, amazing, but it is the earliest one that, you know, that I've been able to get. And uh, you'll see if I do have some notes from the, you know, what's on the inside, uh, I'll put that there also. Okay, here's another one from 1810, very similar. Um, and if you look back, I want to go back to the rate there. You see the single rate of 25 cents for this cover, that first one we talked about. And on this one, um, these are shorter distances, right? So it's a double rate cover, 40 to 90 miles. And you'll find quite a few covers to Hagerstown. Most of them are from Maryland, Pennsylvania, right in a local area. That first one from Cincinnati, that's kind of different because it's out in Ohio. You will see a lot of them from Baltimore and Philadelphia in particular. There, there's quite a few of them there um, because it was kind of the, the Hagerstown Bank was actually a clearinghouse before there were clearinghouses for banks. So that's another good example from 1810. 1814 now, of course, as you get into this, you start looking for the for the common rates, the five, tens, whatever, whatever they might be, 25. Here's a 37 and a half. So it's a triple rate. So that's, of course, very interesting. And it's from Annapolis. That's one of the earlier Annapolis uh, cancellations. So uh, also very interesting cover. I'm sorry that I'm going so quickly, but I have a lot of them to show to you. Um, this one here um, from Frederick, which is a, a neighboring town, uh, the area where I used to live, about 20 minutes east of Hagerstown. And you see they actually uh, divided it up there. If you look at the cover, like Hager is a separate word than town. And they did the same thing with Frederick and a separate word town, you know. So eventually they dropped the word town for Frederick, but they didn't drop it for Hagerstown and it all became one word. Uh, so that's a 16 cent rate uh, from 1814. Very, very nice cover there too. Another one from Annapolis. Um, and one of the other things you start to notice too are the other markings that are on there besides the standard type things. Like here's a, one that has the paid next to the 25, right? You start looking for a few things like that. And you also uh, start seeing a lot of the dealers, you know, put the dates on there, the different things. So this is a 25 cent rate here, uh, courtesy of David Snow, another great collector. So these are some of the ones that are going to be a little bit more expensive. They're not the most expensive, but, you know, the War of 1812 rates, you know, they, um, um, changed because they had the 50% uh, surcharge on there. So you'll see the different rates that went into it. And this one is really amazing. This is from Cliff Alexander, you know, very accomplished collector. Um, and he, he really specializes in Georgetown and uh, Washington area. And this is um, from the first day of the War of 1812 rate, which included that 50% um, percent surcharge. So it should have been 10, uh, 10 cents but it's got the extra five cents in there for the 50%. So kind of neat to have a first day of the war rate cover. I'm sure, I have no idea what the value of that one is, but uh, I'm quite sure it's way more than average. Okay, here's another old uh, old town, Maryland. And it's funny, like I said, I lived in Maryland for 25 years. I never even heard of old town. I had to look it up and see where it was. So I started learning a little bit more about it. And as you get into each one of these covers, there's so many different things you can research. You know, I found out who the postmaster was and, you know, you start looking at some of the uh, materials that are inside of it that have names and you look for different banks and things like that. Unfortunately, for some of these here, I don't have the insides of them to do that extra investigative work. 
but uh, sometimes you can tell some things from the outside. So it's kind of neat. Um, here's a Baltimore cover. It's a triple rate. This is from Ron Sapola. 15 uh, cents times three for the 45 cent rate from Maryland. And as you can see now, we're up to like Kendall and Powers, you know, 20 and, and 17 down at the bottom. So there were actually quite a few different, um, you know, CDS, uh, you know, circular date stamps that were used um, prior to this one here even. All right, another war rate, and this one's at the 37 and a half. Uh, Richard Frajola, uh, for you guys that don't know him, please just Google his name and you'll get to his website. There is a huge, tremendous amount of great information there. I searched his database. I searched on Siegel. I searched a lot of different places and got the permission of people to, to be able to use these for this presentation. But um, it's a great place to go. And uh, if you're trying to research something, please look at Richard Fajola's site. Very, very good. And um, you know, as you can see down in the bottom there, um, my math probably isn't actually correct with all the parentheses in the right place, different things. But we had to figure out that this is a, a double rate here at 37 and a half cents because of the 50% surcharge. So that's kind of neat there. Another 45 cent uh, rate. And it's it's interesting that you see Anthony Dewey. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, a very accomplished collector, does a lot of great exhibits. So it's kind of neat to know that there are even top level exhibitors and collectors that are collecting this same stuff that I'm doing. Just they have all the really good ones. I have the $10 ones, right? They have the hundreds of dollar ones, but um, this is a pretty neat one too from Baltimore. Another uh, war rate here. Um, this one I couldn't tell. Um, you know, I'm a Philadelphia guy, but at the bottom there, you know, that PHI, and you see the uh, seven there. I couldn't tell whether it was for June or July. So if you guys look at this, I, I'd be happy to share this presentation. I'll, uh, we have a lot of different ways we can do that. Um, I'm always looking for for help to try and identify some things. So um, that's a Philadelphia one though. Another one from Frederick uh, Town, and I put those in parentheses because if you see, they actually have the FRED, and then it's got an N with a dot underneath of it in the circular date stamp for the Frederick Town, and uh, that's also from the Frajola website. Um, this is a, another neat one here that we have from Baltimore with a, just a single rate. Um, it's it's fairly common, but I was able to find out that it was from the Bank of Maryland and James Cox was the cashier. <clears throat> so what I started doing, now I knew who some of the cashiers were at some of the other banks, right? As I investigated this stuff. So I actually made a little spreadsheet with that also. And I could um, you know, put what years they were there at each one of their different banks. So it's kind of neat when you go back and start cross-referencing a little bit. So it's uh, good information. This is another one here from Old Town, which is kind of neat. Like I said, I, I hadn't heard of one, let alone now here's two. Um, I couldn't figure out, and maybe we can get back to this. If you guys want to take a note, we'll get back to the end. I, I can't really tell if that is June or July. I could ask Dr. Clagg, you know, he may have that information, but um, I just put a little note on there um, because see how it looks like J-U-N-Y, and it's not an L, and you know why do we need the Y if it's June? Um, so take a note on that. If anybody has information, I'd appreciate it. All right. Now here's one. This is one of mine. And now, as you can see, um, I can look on the inside, right? Cause I have the cover and I have a, um, HP 7740. It's a large format scanner and I highly recommend it. It's a very good scanner, easy to use, and you can actually do up to 11 by 17. So some of these letters were fairly large, but I use it for a lot of other things too. Um, but as we mentioned before, James Cox was the cashier at the Bank of Baltimore. So I put a notation at the top right of the letter and just to help people to read that a little better where it says Bank of Baltimore. And then it says James Cox. He's got a very fancy signature there. And I put the dates that he was the cashier at that bank. And it's kind of interesting. I don't know you guys as far as banks go right now. But you look at this and it's 40, uh, 44 years that he was the cashier at that bank. Eli Beatty was 50 some years at his bank. Um, I don't think anybody stays at any bank anywhere near that in these days. So pretty interesting. Another war rate here, pretty simple one uh, from Baltimore. 15 cent single rate. 
And uh, here we had a little bit on the inside there. Dr. Clay, you had this in his exhibit there. Um, it's a single rate, but it's the 50% um, the rate again. So it's actually a 30 there. And some of these things look different. You know, you look at it, is it a 50, is it a 30, whatever? Well, it helps to know when the date, you know, that it was used and you go back and that can help you verify it. You might be able to see a little bit better what the actual uh, rate was there. Sometimes it's hard to tell. All right, here's another one that's a, a single rate of 12 cents um, from, uh, so I might've got this backwards. Sick. I have Baltimore up at the top. So please forgive me for some of these. and. Uh, I'm going to go back and make some changes here, but I had so many of them. It says Baltimore, but it's actually from Chambersburg. So I need to go uh, go look at that. And I've included William Spriggs for after you for $100. William Sprigg was the name that was very familiar in the western part of Maryland, but I can't make a connection to if he was possibly related to Daniel Sprigg, who we'll get to a little bit later. So that's something. Um, and there are great resources out there. And just so you guys know, I think I've mentioned it before. I have a bubble up site that has tremendous amount of resources. Just don't have all the time necessarily to look into each and every one of these things in detail. So if anybody's interested in that, I do have a lot of information on Western Maryland and Hagerstown in particular, too, that, uh, to look for that. But I still haven't been able to, to find it. So here's another one from Chambersburg. Um, and now this one, a closed, you will find the check of D Sprig, right? So I'm thinking that that's Daniel Sprig. I don't know because he was actually the president. He started there at the bank at the same time that Eli Beatty did, but he was a um, he wasn't the cashier. He was a teller at the bank, right? So um, you'll see his name come up as a teller, and then he gets promoted eventually up to the cashier. Okay, here's another one uh, from the Union Bank of Maryland in Baltimore. Um, some of these signatures are really, really difficult to find out in the way that I worked on that, to find out that this was Ralph Higginbottom. Um, there's a lot of newspapers in the time. And what I would do is I would Google like Union Bank of Maryland cashier uh, 1815. And sometimes the cashiers had to do reports to Congress and they their name would be included in that report. And you'd be like, oh, that's that's what that is, right? Because you can't always tell with that handwriting. Sometimes it's very difficult to pick out. But once you start making a little database of those, it's a little bit easier because you can look back and say, I think I have one from that time frame, and it might help a little bit. So that that's very good. Another Baltimore, this is a quadruple rate for 60 cents. Uh, another interesting cancellation there. And uh, Williamsport, there were quite a few. Williamsport's uh, very close um, uh, to Hagerstown. So that's always going to be a single rate. And you'll find later there was actually a cashier that was there that had very, very distinctive writing. And we'll, we'll get to him in just a little bit. But the rate there was 12 cents for the war rate in 1815. Here's uh, Hagerstown one. It's a double rate, uh, also very close, but 24 cents. So it was actually pretty expensive to mail a letter during that war rate time for sure. Uh, another one from Cumberland. And some of these uh, covers, it's kind of interesting how they scan. You know, this one looks pink in particular. I'm not sure if that's actually the way it is, but, um, you know, they all look a little bit different. And this one, as you can tell, the, the rate is tiny up in the top right there. It's kind of difficult to see, but uh, you can see the 15 up there. All right. Another one from Williamsport. Um, a double rate from uh, the close distance. And uh, here's one from Georgetown. And I have the, the from the inside of it, this is one of Cliff Alexander's. And uh, I, I do have it where it says Bank of Columbia and William Wan, W-H-A-N-N, -N, is the cashier because we got the signature out of that. So um, that's kind of neat. I cataloged that and I kept that in my database. Another Williamsport one. And um, that is Kanakocheeg Bank of Williamsport. Um, which is pretty interesting because um, there were several banks around that area, and I did a lot of research on it. I Googled everything that I could could do and trying to get as much information about how mail got to each one of these banks and from each of these banks. And so there's a lot to research when you uh, when you start getting into them, even though they seem fairly simple, uh, it can get quite complicated. 
And um, here's another one from um, Washington City. I put it in parentheses up there. You see that uh, it's kind of a distinctive cancellation there. And another check with W Sprig. All right. Like I said, I, I need to find that out there with his relationship to Daniel. And uh, another Georgetown from Cliff Alexander. He did, I do have the inside there where I can identify that it's from the Farmers and Mechanics Bank, a triple rate for 30 cents there. And this is really awesome because it's the last day of the war rate. So that's an, an interesting cover also. And that's, I put those in red so you can tell the ones are a little bit different. Now, if you're looking for the expensive ones, this is where these come in. Um, I don't know if you, I guess I can say the name of the dealer. Don Toker had some um, several of these restored rates. And I was looking, you know, most of the covers, like I said, I spend 10 or $15 maybe for these covers. None of them are very expensive. And Don had several covers that were like $350, $375. They were really expensive. And I'm like, well, what is this about? Well, I obviously didn't know about restored rates. So anytime you're looking for a gold mine, you'll hit the, hit the lottery or whatever. Anytime you can find covers between April 1st of 1816 and April 30th, I'm sure a lot of you guys already know this and probably search for those things. But it was just that one month that they use these rates. And those are very, very expensive. We're talking sometimes 20 or 30 X the value of a cover, you know, a month or two before or after. So Always look for April 1816. That should be on your radar. So we do have a couple of those here. I, I don't personally have any, but uh, Dr. Claggy has this one here from Fredericktown. Um, very interesting one. And then you see the 16 cent rate. And, um, you know, I, I had a hard time. The reason I don't have any is that it was really hard for me to justify. You know, all it really has different from all the other things that I have. It just has a different number, right? Do I want to spend $300 on that, right? So I chose not to, but if you have an exhibit, obviously you need to have these type of things to, to be complete, right? You have to have some representations of those, but um, this is really cool. It's the second day, right? It's April 2nd. So that's a really early cover. So um, very, very desirable. So and here's one from April 3rd. This is one of Don Toker's. Um, he's got a lot of great stuff and I'm not saying he's overpriced or anything else. There was a reason why they were expensive. He's a, He's a great dealer and has a lot of great stuff, so um, please use him. But uh, that'll show you the April 3rd one there. I have one from April 13th from Ron Sopola. Very nice cover here with the eight cent rate. Another eight cent rate from uh, Williamsport, that Kanaka Chi Bank. And uh, Williamsport for 16 cents. And that's that's all that I've come across for those restored rates. So they're out of 10,000 covers, they're very, very difficult to come by. And that's why they cost so much, right? Because there's so few of them just during that one month. So in May of 1816, we had a, a, another rate change. We had a couple here. This is actually, in my mind, it's a really cool cover, but mostly because of, of the where it came from, from Shawneetown, Illinois. Right. I mean, who expects somebody to send a cover? I'd really, really be interested in seeing what's inside of there. And why did somebody from Shawneetown, Illinois, have doing? why were they doing business with somebody in Hagerstown? Right. And you now one of the things that I can look at there, you see how the, um, the, the 25 cent rate was scratched out where it became actually a, a 50 cent rate. So it, there's a lot, you know, a lot of interesting puzzles on each of these things, but that's that's very odd that Shawnee Town. I haven't seen any that far away. Another one from Frederick here. Um, that's 18 cents uh, at that time, a triple rate from uh, Frederick. And as you can see, sometimes uh, uh, sometimes it's a, I've gotten input from Rick Leiby, who's one of my mentors on different things. He's like, uh, be careful when you erase stuff because you never know what you're really erasing. This 1816 and the 18 on there, well, it seems kind of obvious. Um, it's not my cover. I didn't erase it, but um, I would use caution. You know, sometimes you'll have initials. You might you know, have some provenance or other clues that you might have there written on there in pencil. But, uh, you know, sometimes it's, uh, it's good and sometimes it's kind of annoying to see that. Um, here's one from Hancock, Maryland. Um, very nice. As you can see, the pensmanship is, is really good there. And another thing to note is Hagerstown is one word, right? So that's uh, that's a little bit different there. Hancock was uh, wasn't very far from H uh, Hagerstown either, the Union Bank there. 
And uh, this is another place I didn't know existed, Graysome, Maryland. But uh, there are a couple covers in here from Graysome. So um, it, it's very close, actually, to Hagerstown. And I lived near there, and I had never even heard of it. And as you can see, even though it's written around the same time frame, they wrote it in two words, Hagers and Town, you know, capitalized the town. So that's kind of interesting. And you'll see things, too, like you see Eli Beatty. Um, here it says E-L-I. I have seen E-L-L-I-E. -L -L -E. I have seen E-L-I-E, -E, which it's supposed to be. Um, but there's all different um, versions of it that you'll see. Um, here's one that I had that I thought is very interesting from Columbia. There's a lot of uh, Pennsylvania covers included in this, too. And this one is, is definitely uh, interesting because uh, we believe it was privately carried. Right. So that's kind of neat. Uh, David Snow had this on the Frajola site. And uh, I, I can't read this stuff on the right. It's uh, very difficult. But, um, you know, when you don't have the rate on there, um, that was the assumption that it was privately carried. So that's uh, also very interesting to us. Um, and this is um, one of my personal interests. Uh, I don't know if you guys know Wayne Farley. He's uh, just down the road from you guys over in West Virginia. But um, one of the things that I've worked with on him a little bit is getting things from uh, cities that were in Virginia that are now West Virginia. Like in this case, it's Shepherdstown, Virginia. It's now Shepherdstown, West Virginia. So that's very interesting to me. And you see the uh, triple rate. And the small paid, uh, red paid there. Uh, Wayne has a, an incredible collection of West Virginia postal history. If you ever get a chance to see it, I would definitely take that opportunity. Uh, he has several Eli Beatty covers in there. And uh, there's a lot of other really great stuff to see. So he's a great guy. Uh, here's another one from Georgetown um, during this 1819 10 cent rate. Right, you can see all these different cancellations with Georgetown. And, and I'm not a, a Georgetown guy, but you uh, find out when they start doing the different rates, you, you start looking at different things like the thing along the bottom there, how it's a line and then there's a dot in the middle. And they have some that are just a line and this, there's different ones. So you find out all the different things with different cancellations. So you can do a lot of postal history research for not a lot of money on some of these inexpensive covers. All right. Here's uh, here's one of the ones I thought was really cool. I um, I saw this Matt Liebson, another great dealer in Ohio. Um, he had this up there and it's a 10 times rate, one uh, dollar rate from Baltimore. So that must have really been a big, heavy letter to, to be there. A lot of sheets. And you see the Baltimore cancellation, the same thing like I'm talking about on the bottom, that line with the dot in the middle. You know, you find the different Baltimore cancellations, too, are very interesting. But 100 cent rate, you, you don't see very, I haven't seen very many of those. All right, here's another Washington City. Um, it does have Hagerstown as one word. It's from the Bank of Washington in um, Washington City. And I put D.C. in parentheses there. However you want to annotate this stuff, you know, make it useful for you is great. Um, Baltimore, fairly common cover. We're still uh, with James Cox, you know, from the Bank of Baltimore there, right? So that's a, a nice Baltimore cancellation there with a 30 cent a triple rate. Um, here's Baltimore, a double rate. Um, and now this is the Commercial and Farmers Bank. Um, another thing I tried to do was start make a database of the different banks in the different cities. Because, um, you know, every one of them is a little different and they each have a different cashier and you'll start to understand these, uh, the cashier signatures, you know, they'll, they'll become recognizable to you after you do, I don't know, a couple hundred of them. And another Washington City here from the Bank of Washington. Um, nice cover, a triple rate, 30 cent. And um, Baltimore here, this is, now this one is, is really interesting to me and um, it could probably take a long conversation here, so I don't want to get too involved in it um, because I'm not an expert. On it. I'm always looking for advice on it. But as you see here, it was rated for two and a quarter ounces, right? So that's a nine times the 10 cents per one quarter ounce, right, for a total rate of 90 cents there, right? And we have a couple of these where they were rated uh, by weight and not by sheets. So that's it. Uh, Certainly something that's very interesting to, to see the difference there. 
Um, this is another guy. Um, uh, so up at the top there, as you can see, I put the A and then the underline. I could read the A and I could read the office, but I, I couldn't figure out what was in the middle there. So I'm always trying to decipher all these di little different things here. So any time you guys go through this, if you have information to add, please let me know. And seeing Sylvester uh, Fowler, I don't think this was from a bank. Um, so it's interesting to find out where it came from. <coughs> Um, here's another Washington City uh, triple rate for 30 cents. William Bradley, the cashier, he was only a cashier for seven, seven years. That's pretty low compared to some of these guys that we're dealing with. <coughs> and here's one you'll see with the, the, the Baltimore. You see the uh, cancellation there is a little elongated. It's a little strange. Some of them I think might be because of the scans. I'm not really sure, but. It's interesting to see the, the differences there and they start to jump out at you. This is May of 1823. All right, you see a little bit uh, fancier writing here too. Another wash city um, from Cliff Alexander, a single rate for 10 cents. Um, here's another Annapolis one, which is uh, pretty neat because uh, I ended up with several of the Annapolis and um, and they're not very expensive either. So they're they're fun and interesting to collect. And there's several different varieties, but um, they had the Farmers and Merchants Bank of Maryland there and uh, Joseph Pinkney was the cashier. And you can see the letter there. I didn't spell everything out in the letter. I did do it in one, which you'll see later. Um, that may be one of my eventual goals is to uh, write out the letters um, so that people can see what's actually there. Um, here's one from Harrisburg, uh, which is kind of interesting because um, the Harrisburg, you know, people from Pennsylvania that love the, you know, Pennsylvania cancellations, you'll see this Harrisburg cancellation there and from the Harrisburg Bank. And the cashier there, John Forster, well, what I started doing was finding out a little bit more information. What did they do when they weren't? cashier of the bank. Well, he was in the state Senate and he was a colonel in the War of 1812. So um, Google's got a lot of information out there for you for uh, these different guys and it's worth looking them up. Now, this is an interesting one for me from Old Town, which uh, as I said, I wasn't sure where that was. But um, what, what, what's kind of interesting for me up there is in the top right, if you look at that, I couldn't tell on the right side. So was the rate 10 cents? Right, because it's kind of easy to see that really dark line in the zero. And then behind it, you can't really tell. Is that a two to make it 20 cents? Or is it a four to make it 40 cents? So sometimes these things have, uh, they have more questions than answers, right? But um, you see the per mail in the bottom left side. So that, that's kind of interesting. So, and I don't think this was from a bank, right? It's from an individual. So you'll see some differences in how they, how they wrote things there. So anyway, you guys take a look and tell me what you think. <clears throat> Here's another um, $1 one, the 10 times 10 cent rate. And it's also got the ounces instead of the sheets. So that would be um, for the one quarter ounce, you know, times 10, right? The two and a half to come up with that $1 rate there. So that's another interesting one. And a uh, simple one from Frederick, a uh, very clean cover, looks good. Uh, Ann and Elwin Doubleday, great dealers. Um, if you get a chance to deal with them, they have some great uh, materials too. I, I believe they're on eBay and other places. You can see them in auctions and different things. But um, they have some really nice covers out there too. And then in 1825, we had another rate change, which makes things interesting, right? I guess that always changes things up for us here. Um, this one, I had a kind of a, a uh, dilemma on it because this circular date stamp um, from Hancock, it says that the earliest known usage of it is 1833, but for whatever reason, um, and I don't know, it's probably because of where I got it, this outlaw Nick, it's on the Frajola site, it listed a date of 1825. Well, I can't see the inside of it, so I don't know if that's correct or not, or maybe I misidentified the circular date stamp. So I'm always uh, looking for help to, uh, to help figure out some of these mysteries. Now this uh, Chambersburg one has a little bit of a history to it there. I'm not gonna read all through that. You guys can do that. This is from Rick Leiby. Like I said, he's a great mentor and uh, has a lot of knowledge about postal history. Um, I, I can only hope to scratch the surface of what he knows. 
But this one, um, the unusual part of this is the way marking on it. So um, that's worth looking at there and, um, you know, how the charges were and how far it was from Chambersburg to Hagerstown. So please look at that one when you get a chance, uh, when you go through this uh, slide deck, we'll make it available to you. Um, here's one from Rockville. It's one of the first ones I had from, from Rockville, Maryland, uh, just down the road from Hagerstown. Um, it's a little bit more than 30 miles, I believe, 1825. Another one from um, Har uh, Annapolis. One of the things I found out that was really cool on this one, it says mail in the bottom left, and I put a little notation for that. But this actually came from a treasury office. And I found out um, there is a treasurer of the Western Shore. And um, this was an office that this Benjamin, Benjamin Harwin, uh, Harwood had. And I assume it's the Western Shore of Maryland there uh, near Annapolis, as opposed to the Eastern Shore. There was a treasurer for both sides. So it's some extra interesting um, Maryland history to go along with this and to look up. Um, we have another Harrisburg here from Matt. Um, that's a 30 cent rate, um, nice clean cover there. Um, this is pretty neat, another um, Washington DC. And as you've seen, there are several different um, types of this Washington city cancellations. And this was a quadruple rate for 40 cents. So another nice one from Cliff Alexander. Another Georgetown, um, David Snow, um, this from December 1st there. So it's a 10 cent, you know, fairly common cover. So you can get these for not, not too much money. Um, here's, a, here's a triple rate for 30 cents from the Union Bank of Maryland. Robert Mickle, he was another longtime cashier at the Union Bank there. So you'll get to know that name if you uh, get into these covers too, uh, the cashier there in Baltimore. There are several banks in Baltimore, obviously. Uh, now, this is, this is kind of neat, right? There's a lot of story behind this one, one of Cliff Alexander's. And I'm sure you guys, we, we could probably spend 20 minutes just on this cover with the things that you're looking for there, right? I mean, when you first look at it, you see the New York cancellation, you see the city of Washington cancellation, you see the forwarded 18 and three quarters and 18 and three quarters for a total of 37 and a half. It's got Hagers down there and it's got New York. Well, I think what was a, what originally happened here is this letter was sent to Eli Beatty, but it said New York when it should have been in uh, Hagerstown, Maryland, right? So it had to get forwarded. So it's a really cool, you know, we, we, we love this kind of stuff, right? And you see all these different clues on here to uh, trying to figure out how it got from where to where. Okay, another um, uh, Franklin Bank of Baltimore was another one of the uh, downtown Baltimore ones. And uh, uh, James Hawkins as the cashier there for the double rate of 20 cents. Um, here's another one, Winchester, Virginia, um, Bank of the Valley, um, H.M. Brent, you see him as the cashier, so it's one from Winchester, not, not uh, really far from Hagerstown either. Um, Cumberland, and this, um, and I'm open to input on this from you guys, I mean, please tell me if you think it works or not, but um, as you see on the right there, I actually had a translation for this, or a transcription, I guess it would be, not translation, transcription. And I tried to show it in white just to see if um, people would be interested in reading it. I'm going to try to figure out a color that maybe came up well. Um, and I can do that on all of these. So I'm open to feedback on that to see what you think and, uh, you know, if it makes it a, a better looking uh, thing in the presentation or if it's too confusing. I'm open to uh, whatever input you might have. Um, here's another one, and this is, this is kind of neat, um, from uh, Martinsburg, Virginia, which is now West Virginia. But it's free because it was from um, a, a postmaster. So um, that's kind of neat. And as you see, that Martinsburg oval cancellation is very interesting. It's uh, very nice. So that, that's one I have. Um, and now I, I'm just going to touch on really briefly about Daniel Sprigg. Uh, like I said, he started as a teller when Eli Beatty started as the cashier. Well, um, one of the presidents died and they promoted. Eli Beatty to be president for two years. And during those two years, Daniel Sprigg took over as cashier instead of teller. That's what most of this says here. There's, there's more detail, of course, but that's the long and short of it. I don't want to get too detailed because we have a lot of things to cover. But uh, you'll see Daniel Sprigg. So um, when you're collecting Eli Beatty covers, you also want to collect Daniel Sprigg covers because for those two years, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to tell. It had to be during, during those couple of years when they were addressed to him. 
And this one's kind of interesting because it's got it, it's in ounces again, right? So you figure out the rate there. That's uh, one and a quarter ounces, so that's five quarters. That comes out to fifty cents. The handwriting is really beautiful on this, and it's from a Reuben Worthington. Um, even though um, one of the problems, and I know uh, some people with their covers, they're only going to show the backside, and that and that's it, the pretty part. Um, uh, quite honestly, I like showing the whole letter if it's possible. Um, you see the, you know, the things that it's been through in, in the years, right? So um, it's kind of interesting to look at this. It's a little wrinkled, but it's a, still a great cover to have. Um, here's another one from Martinsburg, Virginia, which is now West Virginia. And this is another one that's free from uh, William Long, the postmaster. You see excess paid here, excess half ounce. You see the 12 cent rate. It's not addressed to Daniel's free. There are all kinds of different things to look for on this cover. There's plenty of time to um, look through it. One of the most interesting things to me, of course, being my last name is Kennedy, the editor of the Hagerstown Mail was Thomas Kennedy. So it actually has that there. And William Logan was the, was the postmaster. So it was basically just saying that they wanted this, uh, you know, Thomas Kennedy to, to drop off the letter. So that was that's amazingly interesting to me personally, but that's one of uh, Wayne's. It's that's in his West Virginia collection, which is amazing. Okay, and of course you guys know I like all the Philadelphia ones, so that's another reason I don't mind telling people about eBay because um, I'm, I'm mostly interested in the Philadelphia part as far as owning things. Um, so this is an 18 and three quarter uh, single rate from Philadelphia to Hagerstown, and uh, for people that collect Philadelphia stuff at all. You see the name down there, Joseph Trotter. He's from the Trotter family. And Nathan Trotter is a very recognizable name to everybody that collects Philadelphia because there's a lot, a lot of covers out there to uh, Nathan Trotter, that, that company. So um, that caught my eye and certainly was something that I was interested in having. Um, here's another one from Baltimore. As you can see, that circular date stamp, uh, I, I don't know if it was worn out or if how they how they put it on there but uh it's it's not circular it's not oval there's a lot going on there something interesting to see with the farmers and merchants bank another city of washington this is really a great cancellation right there that that's one of the things that i like about it the best this is a very inexpensive cover and it's addressed to daniel sprig most people don't know who he is i think i probably didn't pay more than about ten dollars for that cover very clean, very nice, uh, great cancellation to uh, somebody that's integral to the history of this Hagerstown Bank with Eli Beatty. So really enjoy that cover. Another Winchester, Virginia here. Um, it does have a water spill. Somebody must have used it for a coaster or something, but uh, still a pretty nice cover there and a great cancellation of, from Winchester, Virginia. Um, Chambersburg. Um, there are quite a few in here from Chambersburg. And as you can see, this one's kind of turned sideways in the bottom left corner. So that's obviously a little bit strange, right? That's different from where they usually did this stuff. And uh, I, I as I was researching things here, um, I, I found some other information about ransoms and things during the Civil War. And it doesn't really have to do with this time period because it happened 30 years later. But that was my presentation. I thought it was kind of neat. So I put it in there, right? We can do that one. Make your presentation. Um, this one I really like from Williamsport, Maryland. It's very close to Hagerstown. As you can see, there is a lot going on here, right? There's the different routes and, you know, it was forwarded and, you know, it went to Baltimore and came back. I'm not going to go through the whole story here, but please take a look at this cover when you get a chance, if you get through the, to the, to the slide deck. And this one was um, uh, expertized by the Philatelic Foundation. So it's very interesting with a, a lot to really research. One of the other cool things about it is the Williamsport straight line cancellation at the top. There were a couple of circular date stamps from Williamsport, but this one was a straight line, so kind of neat there too. Um, here's one from Hancock. Uh, it's actually a, a really nice cover here with the uh, black paid on there. And uh, um, that's a number two that they only had a couple different cancellations from Hancock. So that's one of the earlier ones with a quadruple rate there of 24 cents. Very nice cover. Um, Clear Spring is another place that uh, is kind of neat and it's uh, not far from Hagerstown. Uh, as you can see on the left of this one, it is a straight line cancellation for Clear Spring. I don't think that there are many of those available. That's the first, um, you know, the number one uh, cancellation that they have in the Kendall and Powers book. 
So I believe that that's very difficult to find. Plus, you have the free um, marketing on here for uh, David Ridenour, the postmaster there. So this is one of uh, Doubleday's covers, um, but very, very nice. Uh, another Frederick here, and one of the things I, I wanted to point out on this one is sometimes you'll see these little marks on the covers. At the top right there, you see the three straight lines. It was for three enclosures. Sometimes you'll see one, two, or three, you know, for the different rates. This was a quadruple rate. It had three enclosures plus the outside cover, and I actually just pointed over there and actually showed. It was kind of obvious these are the three things that were enclosed in there. And a lot of the times what was in here is checks and, and different other correspondence. To the best of my knowledge, they didn't save that stuff when they saved these covers. So if you have any of those type of things, they're interesting. There are, uh, you'll see uh, checks from Hagerstown Bank. So that kind of stuff is interesting, but they're usually not associated with the covers that are available that I have seen. So that's something worth looking for. Um, another city of Washington, you see uh, some of their cancellations got much bigger. You know, it's a triple rate, 30 cents. And uh, like I said, sometimes you can see there the can't, I mean, the enclosures that are in there. Another Baltimore, um, you know, as you can see, some of them had pre printed stuff. The Union Bank of Maryland at the top right, uh, Robert Mickle, he was a longtime cashier for this Union Bank. Another Baltimore at uh, quadruple rate. 40 cents for that one. Same guy, Robert Mickle. Um, this Frederick one was kind of interesting um, because I, I looked up the, the different guys here, the Cyrus Mance, um, the bookkeeper, and, and Jonathan McPherson, cashier for this Fredericktown branch bank. And I found out that they also had script notes. I'm not a money guy. I don't, I don't, I don't do anything with coins or, or even bills. But it was interesting. So that's another thing that's interesting to look for. It says Fredericktown. Um, uh, bank on there, branch bank. Um, so if you if you do collect that kind of stuff that goes along with these, uh, kind of need to see. Um, now Williamsport, it's kind of interesting because um, there's uh, their cancellation wasn't really a CDS either. As you can see, it's kind of out of shape, right? It's out around. It's not oval and, and it's not round. And as I mentioned earlier, you know the one guy that has really distinctive writing from Williamsport is John Van Leer. And he was a longtime cashier of the Washington County Bank in Williamsport, Maryland. So, um, and sometimes it's interesting, you can find things from Williamsport, Pennsylvania also. So I, I've looked for those too. And you'll see in the bottom left, it says single, and it is a single rate for six cents. But uh, the more of these you see, you will, under, you will see John Van Leer's handwriting. You'll immediately recognize it from Williamsport. So here's a Harrisburg cover there. Very, some of them are shortened. To the point 1836 we're up to now so he's already been uh, the, the uh, cashier for 20 some years so he's uh, i'm sure got everything down here and one of the things i always look forward to and some of you pennsylvania guys will see see harrisburg has no g here you'll find harrisburg with the g also later so that's another thing to research right just like pittsburgh when do they have or not have the g i'm sorry the h at the end excuse me uh, here's another Williamsport, Maryland, um, that's a uh, very distinctive cancellation there. You know, it's just, I, I like these because they're so different. Each one was so, so different. So they're kind of unpredictable there. Another Martinsburg, uh, Virginia, that's now in West Virginia. And there's some excess, uh, three quarter ounces, and it shows the triple rate of 18 cents. Another one of Wayne Farley's. And as you can see, that uh, Martinsburg cancellation isn't quite circular either or oval. Uh, they're off a little bit. Another interesting one. Uh, from Baltimore, here is another one, um, Commercial and Farmers Bank of Baltimore. Another one of the banks in Baltimore that there's quite a few from. Uh, Frederick, this one has a really awesome uh, cancellation there. As you noticed before, it had the F-R-E-D and the N with the dot under it. Well, now it's got the whole Frederick. And it's just like the Philadelphia cancellations. I've come to know a lot of those you'll have the M with the, it's a capitalized T with the dot under it. You're always looking for all the different variations of these different things. This is from Farmers and Mechanics Bank and uh, that was cancellation that was used in 1837 there from uh, Frederick. Um, as you can see, another crazy Williamsport cancellation uh, with one enclosure there. So it's a double rate for 12 cents from John Van Leer. 
Uh, Georgetown, I kind of did the same thing here. Um, this is just an experiment like the other one. Uh, I just uh, had the transcript there. So I um, just put the text out there so people could uh, see what, what it was actually on there and what it was talking about. This is using the Potomac River from Georgetown. Um, that also was some interesting research that I did. Um, uh, you know, there, there were competing ways to get west. You know, this route, the rivers from the Georgetown, uh, uh, from Georgetown going out into Maryland, those were thought of as ways to get to the west as opposed to, you know, the canals and, and different things that were going through uh, Pennsylvania and New York. And everybody was trying to make that race for the west to get goods out that way. So it's very interesting stuff to uh, to look at. and. Actually, one of the first presidents, I think of, uh, I forget the name of uh, what it was, the Potomac. It was one of the, the companies that, that looked into that was George Washington. So that was interesting research, too. Uh, another Frederick one with a couple enclosures in it from the Farmers and Mechanic Bank, 18 cent triple rate. So even though they were very close, sometimes they were very heavy. Um, this this uh, letter, I, I think it's kind of interesting because it's actually, these guys were fur traders, right? So this Joseph Pearson and son, I did the research on them there and it talks about, you know, the different people as John Hammer and, and how they were actually fur traders, quadruple rate right there from Baltimore. So you find some really neat stuff when you can look inside. Another great clear spring one here that's uh, free. Um, so you see... Uh, that when I first looked at it, I'm like, oh, it looks like G. Washington, right? Well, it, it is, actually is. It's George Washington Corbin, right? He was a congressman. He was a grand nephew of George Washington. So uh, very interesting cover there, too, from Clear Spring. Oh, I'm sorry, this one there. Uh, single rate from, um, from Baltimore. And the reason I like this one, too, so when uh, Daniel Sprigg left the bank in Hagerstown, he actually went to the mechanic, uh, sorry, Merchants Bank in Baltimore. So you'll see his actual signature there, Daniel Sprigg. He was the cashier formerly of Hagerstown Bank. So uh, it's kind of neat. Things come full circle. He did get a promotion uh, at a different bank and, and moved there. Another uh, Williamsport, um, pretty distinctive writing there. Now, this one was not from John Lear, though. It was from actually Jonathan Dahl. It took me a long time to figure out who this was here. He was the president of this Washington County Bank where Lear was the cashier, but for whatever reason, it was actually signed by Jonathan uh, Dahl. So it was fun, fun research. And here's John Van Lear, but we're back to him again, you know, the cashier, right, with his distinctive writing. You see the different enclosures there for the quadruple rate of 24 cents from uh, Williamsport. Another Williamsport, very similar, a uh, couple enclosures. Um, I can only assume that this was almost a daily occurrence from Williamsport to Hagerstown. They were so close. Um, here's one that I, I had never heard of either is Dawsonville, Maryland. Um, actually pretty neat there. Um, great handwriting on that one. It was a single rate. It wasn't really that far from Hagerstown, but uh, I had never heard of that one before. So I got to learn some new stuff with that one. Um, this one's kind of neat. I, um, it's, it's nothing really um, spectacular or unusual, but it's kind of a match set, and that's the way it was sold um, with the 6, 12, 18, and 24 cent rates. Um, there, it was kind of neat. It's all mounted on one piece of paper, and it's got the single, double, triple, quadruple. And I uh, just happened to throw in uh, some Washington County National Bank, you know, uh, one of their uh, bills there, too. So it's a, a match set, I, and that's how I got it. So I left it the same when I put it in here. It wasn't very expensive. Um, Baltimore, 40 cent rate. Another one from Daniel Sprigg from the Mechanics Bank in Baltimore. And uh, George Dunbar, the Commercial and Farmers Bank. And it's funny, you know, like I said, as you do this more and more, you get to actually know these guys' signatures and their handwriting and start to figure some things out. But this was a quadruple rate into Baltimore. I mean, from Baltimore, excuse me. Another Cumberland one here. I thought this was very interesting because it's got the handwritten date in there. It's May 21st. And um, so I, I thought that was kind of neat that they wrote that in there, the 20 cent double rate from the Bank of Allegheny. And they did spell it differently. That's the stuff I put in parentheses is when it's spelled differently. Uh, same thing with uh, another one from uh, Cumberland. This is just a single rate, though, but uh, you see the two uh, circular date stamps and the word single on that. 
Uh, another Baltimore with a one enclosure uh, from Daniel Sprig again. And as you can see, uh, you know, the more of these you see, the more uh, patterns you recognize. And one of the things I, I didn't know about was this Bank of the Metropolis from Washington. So that was a new one for me, right? I, I saw some of those other banks, but uh, this was new and I had to find this um, George Thomas, the cashier there from 32 to 46. So he was there for a while too. Right. And uh, this is a free Frank, a very interesting one there, signed up in the top right with the free. And it almost looks as, the, as if they're using ballpoint ink. I, I, that's another thing I wanted to research at one point. I don't even know if, that, if they had that in 1839. I don't know, but it was a question of mine. But uh, it was Francis Thomas from the U.S. House of Representatives. And, uh, you know, I got a little uh, research on him in the office of the Chesapeake and Ohio Canal Company. That's who he was from. So that, that, that's kind of interesting, a lot of research into that one. It's another one of those uh, fairly plain uh, Williamsport ones. Uh, Rob Fox, um, one thing I'd like to take just a second here. Um, he has a blog um, and he's on Facebook and he does, if you just do a Google search on Postal History Sunday, he has been, uh, I can't even remember how many continuous weeks. He takes a letter, a transatlantic letter usually, and analyzes the whole thing. It's a new one every week. Just put his name, Rob, F-A-U-X, and Postal History Sunday. You will be glad that you did. He does a really awesome job explaining all the different things. I wanted to put one of his covers in here. It is just a fairly common Williamsport one, but he let me use that. Um, here's another Wayne Farley, uh, Martinsburg. Um, I wish I had some of these. They're, they're just really awesome. Um, they're great looking, you know, it's, you got the page written there, you got it stamped there, and you got the Oval Martinsburg, Virginia, before it was West Virginia. Very neat cover and part of his exhibit. Uh, another one here, very similar, but um, this one, um, I'm not really sure. It says under six, then has the six and has 12 for the total double rate. I don't know if they measured it twice or how that worked out, but, you know, it's kind of interesting marking on there. Um, another Georgetown one here, um, with, it was written over, the rate was written over there. You see it started out at 18, ended up 30, and, you know, you see it was forwarded. A lot of interesting things to uh, look at on this one from Georgetown, uh, courtesy of uh, Cliff Alexander. Um, Baltimore here, um, this is the Union Bank of uh, Maryland. We saw Robert Mickle several times already. Um, you see the one enclosure and the Baltimore cancellation. Very nice there, double rate. And this is uh, I, this was interesting to me, the uh, Washington County one. It was kind of at eight, eaten up a little bit at the top right, but it's one of John Lear's uh, Williamsport ones. And uh, like I said, you'll, you've probably already figured out his handwriting style is very distinctive. Um, Franklin Bank of Baltimore here um, with one enclosure. They actually wrote that out and put 20 on there for the for the double rate. So they had the, the two sheets. John uh, James Howard, and it was signed by the president, not the cashier. Um, this one I really like because there's a big story behind this one too. Um, you know, with the Winchester, you have the Williamsport cancellation was forwarded from Williamsport to Hagerstown and as you can see, it was sent initially to Winchester and then to Williamsport and then from Williamsport to Hagerstown. So it took the long way there. As you can see, there's multiple markings on there and it just uh, makes for a very interesting cover. Uh, here's a pretty common uh, Baltimore uh, 40 center. Another Cumberland, one enclosure. Baltimore, another from Daniel Sprigg at the Merchants Bank. Uh, Cumberland here at uh, 10 cents. Um, now this is the Mineral Bank of Maryland. I hadn't heard of that one in Cumberland, but you know, it's got the president's name and the cashier's signature on it. So that's kind of neat. Um, this one in particular, I think is very interesting. Um, I don't know if any of you have looked at, um, uh, Bill Schultz has uh, a page. And if you just look for, uh, six and one quarter cent rate. I think you'll probably find his website on this rate. And I really can't figure out why. I'd, I'd love to hear from you guys if you have uh, more information on it from Falling Waters, Virginia. Um, it's got a six and a quarter rate for a single rate. Uh, I don't know why the quarter is in there. I know all about the stuff that, that Bill put on there with the 
Spanish reals and, and that type of thing, but we don't know why it was used in particular here. So I'm um, always open to uh, discussion on that. I think it'd be fun. Uh, Baltimore with several uh, different enclosures there for a 30 cent rate. Um, this is another interesting one where the rate was changed there. You see, it's got the, the different there. It was uh, originally, it looked like 40 and it had four enclosures and they changed it to five and used the blue ink there. Um, this is another neat one with a high rate of 80 cents. I, I, I This is the only one I've seen with the eight times rate. Uh, Owen and Ann double day cover, but the 80, I haven't seen any of those. And I don't know what the writing is underneath um, there, unless it says two ounces. I haven't figured that out totally yet, uh, but, the, but, but it makes sense because it's um, eight times the quarter ounce rate. So that may be logical. And uh, this is a cool one, another uh, Pennsylvania cover for you Pennsylvania guys. Uh, you know, you had the, uh, that York uh, cancellation in green. So we have one that's uh, got a green cancellation there. Kind of neat. It's the only one I have. Um, there may be more. Another Martinsburg from Wayne Farley. Uh, Frederick, a uh, fairly common one here, but uh, very, very great condition on it. Great cancellation with the Frederick, Maryland. Uh, Georgetown. Um, here's a Baltimore with the three enclosures again, very similar to that other one that I showed. Truman Cross is a long time uh, cashier, and you see he's got a very fancy signature there too, so that becomes recognizable. We'll have several of those. And uh, this is another odd um, place that it came from, uh, Xenia, Ohio. Um, I haven't seen any others like that. Um, like that Illinois one and the Ohio one, those are definitely different there, right? 18 to three quarter cent rate. So that, that's kind of an interesting cancellation from Xenia, Ohio. About 30 cent Georgetown here with two enclosures. We're actually coming towards the end of this. Um, where I'm going to cut this off is, uh, I'm going to go through here just a little bit quicker. This one, I love the, um, the handwriting on this. It looks really great with the quadruple rate. We're only going to go up to 1846 maybe for now and uh, possibly come back uh, for uh, the, the stamp stuff that, that goes a little bit later. I'm sorry, I don't need to run on too long. But uh, here's another uh, Frederick cover, beautiful handwriting, Georgetown. And then 1845. I do want to show you these. These are a little bit different, and, and some of you may already be familiar with this. This large um, boxed paid marking of Baltimore. And there's less than 10 examples of these, but I was able to find some of them. You can read through this and get the background on them, but some of them are really neat here, as you can see with the paid and the five cancellation from Baltimore. Um, some of these, um, they feel like they weren't genuine. Um, so there's you know, a couple different theories on this. But you see some of these um, paid cancellations there and a lot of them, you know, there's only 10 of them. So several of them were sent to Eli Beatty. I guess it was all at the same time. It's great cancellations right here. This is clear, you know, Baltimore. All right. Now this one, um, I guess we can uh, almost end on this one. If uh, you guys uh, want to unmute, that's fine. And uh, as you can tell on this one, everything looks kind of common, right? Common, kind of ordinary, except for the one thing in the middle there, the top middle. I think everybody can kind of see, right? This James Buchanan 10 cents, right? So yeah, it's just just not in the right place <laughs> at, the, at the right time frame, right? So I did a little research. I, I found out a little bit about this and I'd love for you guys to read through this and you know some of the expertization that went into um, determining that this was a fake. Um, it was uh, Pat Walker, Van Copper Smith and uh, in the Classic Society, they have information there and uh, also, uh, I think there's other places that that uh, have information about this, but uh, this label. Long story short, the label was added on to the cover. It's a very common cover, and they did in uh, 1946. The Baltimore Philatelic Society produced some souvenir sheets, and somebody cut it out, put it on there. So that's a kind of neat thing to see. Another. So that was in the middle of that, and all of this. Just so you know, this is all um, okay. So, so that, that's where I am there. Um, th these are all in chronological 
order. Um, that was my choice to do that. Uh, I know that there are um, other people that do presentations in different orders, and um, maybe you know, maybe you can do it from city, you know, that it came from, or the rates. There's there's a lot of different things. Personally, I found the only way I could really keep track of it was by doing it chronological order because there was just so many, and I I have not shown them all. I you know I stopped at like 1846 there. I haven't shown all the ones that, that we have stamps on them, right? Which of course start with the 1847s and go up. And, and I kept this range just until the time, you know, that, that uh, Eli Beatty was there. So it only goes up to 1859, but that's a lot of, that's a lot of time in there, those 12 years. And there's a lot of covers out there with stamps on them too. A lot of five cent and <laughs> a couple 10 cents from Philadelphia, which um, was one of the things that interests me from the beginning of it. So I'm sorry, I've taken a lot of your time. I hope it was interesting to look at some of these. And um, I have probably at least this much again for a second part if you're interested in it. Um, and I'll, I'll definitely make this available to everybody, send you guys a link. Um, we can put it on Bubble Up. It's a, it's a uh, website that I use that I really like. A lot of clubs are, are using it now. You can share things on there. I can put it on there and send you an invite or you know, the club can send you an invite and you can download it right from there if you're interested in further research on it. Well, very good. Thank you, Steve. We give you a loud applause. Oh, thanks very that was, much. That was wonderful. I and uh, it. I, I know where you live. And uh, one of my jobs is to get speakers. So <laughs> we want to get we want to get part two. That is fair. Now, what was, what was the total? About 10,000 covers? Um, um, well, that that's what they're projecting is somewhere around that. Um, and I, you know, I between Dr. Clay, you and a couple other people I've spoken with, and the ones that I have, probably eight, nine hundred frames that I have like access to, probably. So there's still many, many. You know, there's there's thousands of them out there, and and probably you guys that maybe haven't looked this so closely at your collections, I'll, I'll bet if you go through and look at your covers, you're like, oh, here's an Eli Beatty, <laughs> and uh, right. I may not have thought well, of it you. before, but they're yeah. out there. Well, are you ready for some questions? Oh, uh, sure, absolutely. Okay, folks, fire away. Al. Uh, Steve, um, Hagerstown, uh, going back to where you began, living in yes. Lancaster, we used to have a department store here um, owned by the Hager family. Is there oh. any tie-in between the Lancaster Hager department store family and Hagerstown founding? I would have to look that up. You know, this was Jonathan Hager was there, you know, that was 1790s. So I don't know, maybe it was a descendant down the road. Um, like I said, I, I do have that stuff on Bubble Up too with the history of Western Maryland. And I do have the same thing for uh, Pennsylvania too. There's there's so many multi-volume, really big, long books mm -hmm. to, to, and they're all searchable. So you don't have to go page by page to look at this stuff, but it's mm -hmm. certainly a topic worth, worth you know, looking mm -hmm. at, I mean, it's interesting to see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Sure. Steve. Hi. Yeah, yeah. Um, my family and I lived in Hagerstown from uh, 95 to 1995 to 98, but we were raising oh. a small family and my um, stamp collecting period was in a bit of a hiatus at that time. But um, just a comment on that, the um, ransom of Hagerstown, that's a, that's a really interesting story that the locals tell you that uh, right. the confederate army came up to hagerstown um and was looking for more funds and the city fathers said well here's twenty thousand. that's all we can afford we're go to frederick we're they're richer right. over there <laughs> right right there, there, there's just and, so many things that you can go up on tangents with this yeah that, that are if, very you know funded research yeah, and of course, not far from Hagerstown is Antietam, which was oh, one of oh, the, the bloodiest battles of, there. of the Civil War. Yeah, yeah, you're you're not far from Gettysburg, you know, uh, Sharpsburg, good. Antietam, exactly. and all that's right there. It's a very historic area. How about Dave? Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, I did. I, and as, this was a lot of fun. I, I lived, you said you lived in the Frederick area. Over about yeah. a 25 year period, I lived in. Uh, Myersville, Middletown, yeah, Middletown first, oh, yeah. Yeah, both, Middletown, both Middletown, Myersville, Williamsport, and Hagerstown, and my son now lives in Martinsburg, now West Virginia, 
But wow. um, one, of, one of the questions I had, there were several, several uh, covers that were from the um, Bank of Allegheny or something like right. that, the one in Cumberland. Yeah. Was that, is that spelled, uh, and I saw you had the H inserted in parentheses. Right. Well, is is yeah. that in the, in the name of the bank and you just, how does the bank spell its name? I put well, it that way. I, I, I can't say that off of my t top of my head authoritatively because I'd have to go back and look at it. But I, I know that there were, there were different spellings. Sometimes it was the way the person spelled it on the letter. And maybe that's why I put it on there. Um, but I, I'd have to go back and look. Yeah. Because I can't yeah, no, I, that, I, that, that H is really weird. The G and the H and those different things, you know, with where they had different spellings. Yeah, I know. You know Cumberland is the it sits in Allegheny County, Maryland, which is not spelled with an H. Does not have an H in the middle. But if you're talking about the Allegheny Mountains, you use the H. So, <laughs> yeah, so, um, oh, and it was a good try on the on the Bank of Conakachig. Oh, geez, I was, I, <laughs> there's your pronunciation <laughs> well thank you very much uh, obviously there's a lot of indian names there that uh, yeah. are very interesting it's a great great area i love living there i i, I lived in middletown uh for uh, quite some time my kids went to middletown schools and then i moved to myersville i lived uh my my address was actually myersville but i lived a mile uh, i'm sorry about 20 minutes north of the Myersville post office. I lived up in, in the mountains. I lived in Murdoch. Wolfsville. Yeah, I lived close to the Wolfsville. <laughs> yep, Mur Murdoch. You know. Yes, I did. So it was awesome. George, did you have something? Yes, the great presentation. Oh, thank you. I just have two questions. One, how do you pay 18 and three quarter cents? Um, well, see, I, so the, I am not an expert on that. The thing that I got, you know, like from uh, the things that I learned from Bill Schultz or whatever, that how some of these were like tied to Spanish reals, you know, I, and, and I, I'm not an expert on that. I have to be honest with you, but, yeah. you know, there's a lot just of that. Physically, type of thing just on physically, there. how do you do that? I, I, can anybody help with that? Where, where's Charlie when you need him? He probably knows that yeah. right off the top of his head. Steve, I'm guessing that it's the six and a quarter at triple rate. <laughs> you know what the six and a quarter is. Yeah, right. You pay three of those. But I, I don't know if the real, the coin to real was actually worth six and a quarter. I, I, I honestly, I'm sorry. I wish I could help more. I'm not a well, who did the senders of these letters, who did they use so, to keep track of what they owed? Uh, well, I uh, so I, I don't know. See, I, I'm, that's another thing that would be I'd be very interested in trying to figure out is how these letters all got to Hagerstown. Like, did they, did they have a cashier on their end that dropped them off at a post office and that's where they paid? Or did they give them a, 20 of them at one time and then they told them what they owed? I, I you know, I can't answer those. If so, I remember Bill's presentation, they, they split the real into eight. Pieces, yeah, of eight. pieces of eight and then so that was 12 and a half and then they divided one of those 12 and a half pieces in half to get the six and a quarter yeah if i remember rightly from from bill's presentation but and triple that rate would be the 18 and three quarters right yeah who got paid that and how did you pay three quarters of a? I, I don't know if there were like if you gave them three pieces of three coins that were worth six and a quarter each. I, I, I don't mm -hmm. know. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting puzzle. I... Yeah, there's a lot to research. There's a lot more to know. That's for sure. Yeah. Snip just just so you guys know, they would snip it. That's what Bill Schultz said. Okay. They had him uh, scissors and they'd snip the pieces out, pieces of eight, twelve, whatever. That's what they would do. Three quarters, boom. That's it, yeah. just the way they cut it. They considered it paid. They must have had some great shears to be able to do that, you know. And strong hands. Pieces of metal. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah no doubt. And, and I, I would like to offer anybody that's interested in, you know, contributing to this or helping to research things. I'm always open to that. I, I appreciate I love the camaraderie. I love the you know, the whole club, and you guys are awesome. Uh, having these presentations and uh, having so many people involved, uh, there's so many experts. So please, you know, 
contact me. Uh, you, you guys can find me. You can Google me. You'll know exactly my email and everything else. And okay. uh, I'd love to have people contribute to this. Dave, I, uh, let me see. I have a question. Sure. When I want to know how far it is from here to there, I go to my map program and it, it gives it to me in time and distance. When yeah, people the, are sending in all these different zones, was there like a gazetteer that the postmaster had to determine the rates or did they just look at a map? It was a lot of guesswork. And so there's a lot of error variance in these prices or, do you know? Well, Paul, I'm going to put you in charge of figuring that one out. All right. <laughs> I don't, I don't, you know, I can only imagine that they had some kind of books with uh, uh, yeah, yeah. distances listed in there and they figured the rates that way. And I don't know, you know, it's from post office to post office, right? Because right. I looked at some of them too, and some of them didn't make sense to me. Oh. But, uh, you know, based on today's, you know, uh, distances, you know, that we're looking up on Google. Yeah, of course, they didn't have, have mm -hmm. it that easy. I'm sure they had some big book they had to do. Yeah. Paul? Okay. Um, Next. Paul, if you notice on some maps of that period, in a corner, there would be a chart, uh, you know, a crosshatch chart with names of towns, yeah. way, names okay. of towns on the other, and the distances. You and know, I remember seeing those, some of the maps I had as a kid. Yeah, it has that. Like a, yeah, like a cross simulation. At least in England, that's what they were for, was to calculate mail rates. That, 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 there we go, Steve. That's... That's that's, 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 what yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, why, that's why that's why we have uh, all these heads to, together better than one for sure. That's what's fun about this, you know. Um, what's the difference between a bank president and the cashier? It seems like the cashier kind of ran the bank, and president well, was like head of state. I think uh, that president was usually the guy with the money, right? Okay. He kind of owned the bank, and the manager was the guy that maybe didn't have money, uh, you know, the the cashier, you know, but he was responsible for everything. Because uh, one of the stories that I got at the end of all this, too, uh, you know, obviously we're going to touch on that, but uh, right before Eli Beatty died, he actually filed for bankruptcy, wow. which is kind of interesting. And so there's an, another whole interesting thing to this whole banking thing. And Dr. Clagg, you probably has a lot more information on this than me, but they had what they called discount days. And they would give lower interest rates to uh, the guys that were the officers of the banks. And a lot of times they overextended themselves and that's how they ended up in bankruptcy. You know, it couldn't end up paying, you know, even though they paid discounted rates for their loans, they still weren't able to pay them all. They were doing speculation, you know, it was, it was a great benefit to working at a bank. Yeah, that, that was the period. I love that period of American history. Yeah, yeah, they stopped doing that too. <laughs> you know, when they started <laughs> regulating banks, they're like, yeah, we're not gonna do this anymore. Yeah. <laughs> so, I am, uh, I'm looking, I'm, doing a lot of looking through uh, mid 20th century documents with a lot of financial values in them. And I wanna know what they're worth now. So I have a financial calculator. There's a lot of them online that you can use. Uh, mine goes back as far as 1913 so that I know that my dollar and a quarter an hour I made in 1964 is worth, I think 11 a quarter an hour. Is there a way you could get, some, when they're talking about your $100 loan, your $400 loan, I think they're talking about pretty serious money. Is there a way to right. calculate that? Right. Or, yeah, I'm sure it was a fair amount of money. And, and the interest, I think, was fairly high sometimes. Yeah. But that's why they wanted these discounts, you know. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that, that basically when they started this bank, I know it was Colonel Rochester and a couple other guys. And, they, you know, they were the guys that put up the money and they became the directors of the bank. Right? Right. But, yeah. but Eli Beatty ran the day-to-day -day operations yeah. as the cashier slant manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, people? One thing about the partial sense, we're living with it today. When we get gas, there's always a 0.9 at the end. And then when the final tally is there, it's rounded up to the next penny. So I wonder whether that may apply. Yeah, I, uh, I can't answer that. We need to have uh, somebody that's- We have credit business. cards back then. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Other questions, folks? Oh, this has been I great. Just, it really has. Yes. Thanks. Steve, just so you know, the way, and, and, and Paul, the way they figured out a mile way back when was the size of the wagon wheel. Hmm. It took 360 revolutions to make one mile. Wow. 
Yeah. But that had, to be, that had to be a standard wagon wheel diameter, right? Or, right. Yeah, that they went off a standard wagon wheel. Interesting. Well, we had those things, you know, before all the Google. It was like a little wheel. And you'd take it on your map and you'd trace it. And then you'd read how many inches and multiply that on the scale. Right. Like whatever, however a number of miles there are per inch. Yeah. Interesting. Neat. I wanted to know who the guy was that had to stand beside the wheel and count 360 out. Yeah. You know? <laughs> they they, they oh, actually put a odometer on there. They had odometers back then that oh. would spin inside the wheel. And that's how they came up with it. Very well, interesting. In the, in the prisons, they had things like that. It'd count how many times you'd turn your punishment wheel. So you, probably just remember your old bicycle when we were kids. Mm -hmm. The odometer we put on our bicycle to see how far we went. Yeah. It had a spindle that stuck in the front wheel that went around with the wheel. Mm -hmm. I remember. The odometers it. have been in use a long time. Yep. Good. Thank you, Tom. Other questions, folks? comments so we will uh we'll be in touch for uh next year sure. sometime for getting part two that would be great yeah, sounds great really, thanks really a lot i appreciate it guys. yeah no it was like an, a lesson in u.s economic history <laughs> you know and um and this even the, the changes in town names you, you can sure. see that you know when you have a bank guy you know with what 52 years or something like that that's that's sure. that's, that's a lot of yeah. mileage very good Thank you, Steve. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Yep. Thanks.